and welcome to Bolsa Chica Conservancy's public animal feeding. Uh, today we're going to feed our animals that live in our interpretive center. Uh, just an update, right now our interpretive center is closed to the public, but we do have an information booth set up outside on our porch where you can uh, get trail guides um, and uh, donate to us and get things like shirts and stickers and all that fun stuff. So uh, without further ado, we'll get started. So right here we have our California scorpion fish. Uh, his name is Igneous, because he looks like a rock. And scorpion fish get their name because they actually have venomous spines on their fins. So they, they sting. So I've heard it's kind of similar to a snake, like a rattlesnake bite, but I don't want to chance it. <laughs> so we feed her Caitlin fish this fish right here, and she's what we call an ambush predator. She'll sit and wait and use her camouflage and then attack her prey really quick, just like that. And fish have a special cavity in their mouth called a buccal cavity, and they, once they open their mouth, it creates that suction so they can suck their food in. See if she'll go for a second one right now. Sometimes she needs a break in between fish. Next, we'll move on to our uh, swell sharks. And if you guys have any questions, feel free to ask at any time. You can answer your questions through our Facebook Live. So over here, we have six swell sharks. And they like to pile up in the corner over here. These swell sharks, um, all the fish we have in here are native to Southern California. So these guys are native. You can see them out. Um, if you go uh, snorkeling out near some rocky shores. And they are, you can see they're just hanging out in a pile. They're basically nocturnal. We feed them squid and uh, pieces of the capelin fish. These guys were actually hatched here at the interpretive center. We had our friends at the Cabrillo Marine Aquarium donate some swell shark eggs to us. And they were incubating here and they hatched right in this tank. So uh, swell sharks are in their egg case, which is called a mermaid's purse, for nine to 12 months. And the parents don't take any care of them, they just lay the eggs and hope for the best. So that's why they, they lay lots of eggs to ensure that their survival, uh, some of them survive. So the egg cases are really interesting in that they have little strings on the side of them and they use them to attach to kelp so they don't get washed out to sea. And so when they're young, they'll start off as scavengers. These guys are probably about six months old and they can grow to be four feet long. And it's a common misconception that sharks need to constantly swim to be able to breathe. Uh, some sharks are like that, like the great white shark, but these guys are a different kind of shark and they're able to pump water over their gills. And sharks have very interesting skin. If you feel a shark, they feel kind of like sandpaper. And that's because they have what's called dermal denticles. So dermal meaning skin and denticle meaning teeth, like dentist. So they have teeth on their skin. Swell sharks are part of the cat shark family. There's some other species of shark in that family, and that family has an interesting um, pigment in their skin so that if you hold a black light up to them, they fluoresce a green color. It's not quite dark enough for us to show it here, but it's something fun you can look up on YouTube. Oh, almost 
not a shark bite. We also have some other animals in this tank. Right down here, we have what's called a chestnut cowrie. Not sure if you can see it at that angle, but right down here. It's a type of mollusk or snail. And they were sometimes used as currency. And um, almost uh, fished to extinction at one point. And they have a really interesting shell. They're the shells that you usually see people make necklaces out of. They're really shiny and pretty. And they're shiny and pretty because they actually have a piece of their skin that covers the shell. And that keeps the, the salt water from eroding on the shell. So they stay nice and shiny and pretty like that. So next we're going to move to our large tank of fish. Here, you see down at the bottom, he's ready for his lunch. That is a California spiny lobster. And they're different from lobsters you might see in a restaurant with those big claws because um, they don't have big claws. They use their spines to protect them. We have these two fish up here. They are kelp bass. They hang out in camouflage in kelp. We feed them a mixture of capelin, uh, squid and oh, lobster's very hungry today. And um, krill. There it goes. So, another fish we have in here is uh, this big blue one here, and that fish is called a half moon. And the little green guy down there is an opali. He thinks he can eat that whole squid head. <laughs> so opali, you can see in tide pools when they're young, they swim around in tide pools until they get big enough to go out to the ocean. place in here. We do have a couple more animals to feed in this tank. Uh, we have some sea stars. So we have three different kinds of sea stars in this tank. We have the, the big ones over here in the corner. These guys are called giant spine stars. And all of our sea stars eat mussels. I don't know if you've ever tried to open a mussel before, but they're called mussels because they're very strong and very hard to open. But the sea stars are so strong, they can rip open the mussels. This guy right here is an ochre star. And if you look real close, he has all kinds of tiny little suction cup feet. And he uses all of those little suction cups to, to pull the mussel to his stomach, which is in the middle of his body. And then uh, once they get enough of those suction cups on there, they can rip open the muscle. And you can see he only has a few on there, but he's still able to hold on to that muscle. And sea stars are very interesting in that they actually have two stomachs. They have one stomach that they can take out of their body 
and um, digest their food outside their body uh, before they take it in to digest. We feed our sea stars once a week and we feed all of our fish three times a week. And now I think we're ready to move on to our tide pool animals. We also have uh, these, this little fish, he's got really good camouflage. I'll lure him over here. This is called a uh, two-spot hillfish. We feed him uh, little pieces of squid. And then over here, this guy is called a bay blenny. He also eats squid. Something interesting about the bay blennies is you can tell if it's a male or a female by looking at their chin. See, this one has an orange chin, and that means that it's a male. really interesting is our Kellett's whelk. And a whelk is a type of snail. So this guy right here is our Kellett's whelk. You can see he's got this fun piece of shell, extra piece of shell right here called an operculum. And it's like a trap door. And they use that to hide from predators, but also to keep from drying out when the tide goes down. And these guys are actually a predatory sea snail. They eat other snails and mussels and things like that. So what they do is they have a special tongue with teeth on it called a radula. And they take their tongue, they find another snail and they scrape, 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 scrape. So there's a hole. And then they can stick their, uh, their straw-like tongue called a proboscis in there. And that's how they can eat other snails. Another animal we have in here is called a bat star. You can see one kind of hiding under here. But here we have a bat star, and they're called bat stars because they kind of have webbing between their arms here. And just like the other sea stars we talked about, their stomach is in the middle of their body, and they have all those little suction cup legs. And it's like a hydraulic system. It's very, very strong. We'll see if we can get him to eat right there for us. Can you grab it fast enough? So you can see he's using his little suction cup feet to bring the food closer to the middle of its body, where its stomach is. And then a 
balloon-like stomach will come out and engulf the piece of food. Great way to see sea stars in the wild is if you go to a pier and wait till low tide, you can see them on the pilings that hold the pier up. wetlands there are four different species of lizards you can find. We have two of them living here um, so we'll talk a little bit about them. But first we're going to feed them crickets. So since these lizards don't live out in the wild and they don't get a varied diet like they normally would, we give them a supplement of calcium. on our crickets. So right here we have our <laughs> southern alligator lizards. So the southern alligator lizards are different from other lizards you'll see on the reserve because they have a really long tail compared to their body. Good catch. So lizards are measured, their length is measured in an interesting way. Lizards and uh, salamanders, they're measured what they call snout to vent, which means from their nose to where their tail starts. So their tail isn't included in their length when they measure them. So next we'll feed our other lizard we have here. Um, the next lizard is a western side blotch lizard. And this lizard is probably the most common lizard you'll see out on the trails here at Bolsa Chica. They like to sun themselves along the trail and scurry away when hikers come. 
And these lizards are very interesting in that uh, the males of them have three different color forms, um, which are associated with their behavior that they have and their roles. He's camera shy. So another species of lizard we have is called a western fence lizard. And they're a common lizard. You can see they have a blue belly. Sometimes they're called blue bellies. And you can find them on, uh, you guessed it, fences, as well as trees. Um, and the last species of lizard you can find at Bolsa Chica is uh, the silvery legless lizard. And silvery legless lizard, you would think a lizard without legs would be a snake, but these guys are actually lizards. So legless lizards uh, have eyelids and snakes don't have eyelids. So that's another way you can tell them apart. And um, I believe they also have a pelvis, but no legs. So those are the four species of lizards you can find at Bolsa Chica. So next we'll move on to our amphibians. So here we have a northern leopard frog. The northern leopard frog is a very common frog throughout um, North America. Oops, and she will also eat crickets. And she's also an ambush predator like we talked about the fish before. She will wait till the food comes to her and then eat it. Since frogs are very squishy animals, they, they rely heavily on their camouflage to keep them safe. So they don't like to uh, move a lot. So they'll just do quick sudden movements when they're eating. And frogs are very interesting in that they actually use their eyes to help them swallow. So if we see her catch a cricket, you'll see when she's swallowing, she'll squish her eyeballs down. missed that one. <laughs> it's a common misconception that frogs have really long sticky tongues like in the cartoons. Uh, that's mostly just chameleons that have those kinds of tongues. So she still has to catch it with her mouth. She can't stick out a tongue and catch them. Almost. She's not the most precise eater. I think sometimes she doesn't see them when they're hiding on the sides. You can see her very long legs. They're usually tucked up underneath her body. Uh, but those really long, strong legs are used to leap really large distances. She's striking out all over town today.
But as you can see, the way she moves, it's not a constant motion. It's more of a stop and go kind of motion, and that helps her to not be seen by predators and use the camouflage that she's got. So you wouldn't actually find um, frogs at the wetlands because frogs and amphibians need fresh water. And the wetlands we have here is a saltwater marsh. So uh, all the water you'll see here is salt water. We do have a, a connection. Oh, she finally got one. <laughs> see if she squeezes it again with her eyes. We do have a place where fresh water meets the saltwater marsh. And that's a place where you would find uh, amphibians. So now we're going to move on to another amphibian. Uh, this here is a western tiger salamander. And they're actually not native to the area. They're actually an invasive species. So there's a similar California tiger salamander that, that is similar and a little bit uh, smaller, but this one uh, outcompetes the other for food. So that's what can happen if you have an invasive species. Kind of hard to see because uh, he likes to burrow in, in the mud there. And, oh, almost got him. And just like the frog, uh, he's more of an ambush predator, kind of wants to move less and wait for the food to come to them. too close. They're very quick today. So next we're going to introduce you to some of our snakes and then feed one of them. So uh, after we introduce you to the snakes, then uh, if you're squeamish about uh, mice being eaten, we feed them live mice. Uh, it's a good uh, enrichment for them. So if after we introduce the snakes and start to feed, just a fair warning, we feed live mice. So if you want to check out, we save it for last in case you want to check out. So next we're going to um, introduce some of the species we have here. So here we have a coastal rosy boa. Uh, the coastal rosy boa is native to uh, Southern California uh, along the coasts. And they used to be native to the Bolsa Chica wetlands, but due to development, they um, are no longer able to live in this habitat here. So they're kind of in a way extinct in one area. And uh, when that happens, we call that extirpated. So they're extirpated from Bolsa Chica, uh, but they are still native in other parts of Southern California. Uh, next, we have our San Diego gopher snake down here. We've got uh, Catalina. 
Uh, we've got two gopher snakes that live here. We also uh, have Dan back there. I think you get a better view of Catalina. So the gopher snake is a really common snake in uh, California. And uh, they like to pretend that they're rattlesnakes. And they can do that through their color patterns. As you can see, they have kind of a similar pattern as the diamondback rattlesnake and also color. Uh, they can also take their, their uh, tail and shake it in some leaves so it sounds like a rattle. And sometimes they'll even flatten out their jaw bones so it looks like their head is shaped more like a rattlesnake. So a lot, uh, the difference that you can tell between a venomous snake and a non-venomous snake uh, in California is the shape of their head. Uh, the rattlesnakes have a more uh, diamond-shaped head with big chubby cheeks, and the non-venomous snakes, like the gopher snake, have a more oval-shaped head. You can kind of see, it's hard to see from here, but... Uh, next we have a California king snake. So right here we have Arthur, King Arthur. And the California king snake is also a common snake you can see at the Bolsa Chica wetlands. And uh, these guys in the wild eat uh, rodents as well as other snakes. And they're actually immune to rattlesnake venom, so they can eat small rattlesnakes. Uh, they come in, uh, they're always either black and white or brown and cream in different sizes of their stripes. You can see he's more of a brown and cream with thin stripes. We have another California king snake that lives in the interpretive center named Victoria. You can see her over here. And you can see she's got more black and white and thicker stripes. There's her little face. So we've got Victoria here, Queen Victoria. So another snake that we have here in the interpretive center is our ball python. So you can see right here, we, uh, we have a ball python, and as you may guess, this is not a native species to the wetlands. She was actually brought to us by, um, someone left their pet out in the wetlands, so she was a pet. Um, so a number, of thing can, a number of things can happen if you release a pet into the wild. A lot of people think it's a great idea to have your pet out in the wild. They'll be happier in their natural environment and have a better life, but things can happen with uh, that. In the case of the ball python here, she probably wouldn't have lived very long because this isn't a, a, the right environment for her. Um, it, it doesn't have the proper prey items for her, and the temperature and humidity would... would uh, be detrimental to her health. Um, so, but also if you release a pet, you can have the opposite effect where they can do really well in an environment that, um, that isn't their native environment and outcompete native animals. Uh, for example, red-eared sliders is that type of turtle you'll see in ponds. Uh, they can sometimes take over ponds and eat all the food that the native turtles would eat and, uh, and they can be really bad for the environment. So it's always good if you can no longer take a pet, keep your pet to bring them to a place where uh, they, can, they can live happily and, and safe for the environment. So another snake that we have here is uh, the corn snake. So corn snakes are native to the eastern United States, and they're called corn snakes because they like to uh, live in cornfields, and they also have a belly scale pattern that looks kind of similar to Indian corn, not a checkerboard pattern. Uh, she is not native to the Bolsa Chica wetlands, uh, but she was a pet that someone couldn't take care of anymore, so now we use her as an educational animal ambassador. And um, so her name is Neptune. 
So next, I guess that's all of them. We already did Victoria. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, viewer discretion advice, we are going to feed one of our snakes a live mouse. We're actually going to feed King Arthur. So here we have King Arthur. So what we do is we uh, feed our snakes in a separate enclosure from their home so they don't associate their home with food because then they might think that our hands are food every time we stick them in their enclosure. So we're going to put him in the feeding tank here. venomous snake. He is a constrictor. So what he'll do is grab a hold of his prey and wrap his body around it until um, it suffocates and loses circulation to its body. Uh, snakes usually kill their prey before they eat them uh, so that they don't get injured by their prey. Got a nice little coil there. <laughs> so snakes, their strongest sense is their sense of smell. And um, they use their tongue, they use their tongue to smell instead of their nose. They have a special gland at the top of their mouth called a vomeral nasal gland and that helps them to pick up the chemicals in the air and convert it into smells. If you've ever noticed um, a snake's tongue, it has two parts on the end, a fork at the end, and that's how they can tell what direction the smells are coming from, just like how we have two ears. So their sense of smell is their strongest sense, and their second sense that's the second strongest is their sense of feeling. So uh, the snake will be able to feel when the mouse is no longer alive. And it also helps them to stay away from predators. They can feel people walking on the trails long before you see them, which is why it's kind of rare to see snakes sometimes. Uh, so once the mouse is no longer alive, uh, Arthur will actually eat the mouse whole. Uh, so they can eat um, items that are like two to three times the size of their head. And they also don't have any arms or forks and knives. So sometimes it can be a bit of a challenge, but they also have some great adaptations to help them um, eat their prey whole. They can also um, digest all of their food. They can digest the bones and the fur. Some animals can't digest bones and fur, like birds. Uh, so things like raptors and owls, uh, they will regurgitate or throw up the parts of their prey that they can't eat into a small condensed pellet. But the snakes can digest everything, the bones and the fur. We feed our snakes uh, about once a week but they can go up to four months without eating in the wild. Um, they have a different type of metabolism than um, animals like us. So they're what we call cold-blooded, um, which doesn't mean that their blood is cold. It just means that uh, they use the outside environment to warm up their blood. Like for us, we are what we call warm-blooded, so if we put a sweater on, we can um, shiver and warm ourselves up from the inside. Uh, but if you were to put a sweater on a snake, it wouldn't really help them because they need to use outside sources to get their heat. But it's also a very um, energy efficient way that they can um, get, their, get their heat. So usually snakes will eat their, uh, eat a mouse uh, head first. 
a lot easier for them to get it down. As we mentioned earlier, it's, it's a much, much larger than their head, so it can be kind of hard to eat something bigger than your head without any arms. Uh, so it kind of helps them uh, due to the shape of the mouse and the fur and the bones. Uh, so right now what he's doing is trying to find the head to start at first. It's right there. <laughs> So snakes have a very interesting anatomy. As you can guess, they're a very strange shaped animal. Uh, so they, most of their body is uh, muscle and backbone and ribs. And they have a very elongated uh, system. Uh, their esophagus, which is what connects their mouth to their stomach, is very long. It goes almost halfway down their body. And most snakes actually only have one functioning lung since it has to be stretched out uh, to the shape of their body. They also have very interesting jaw bones. Uh, their bottom jaw is, is two separate bones. It's not fused in the middle like ours is. It's two separate bones so they can use it to manipulate their food. And you'll see the way he moves that he's manipulating it with his jaw. So that's another adaptation that they have to help them eat. So you can see that the size of the mouse is much larger than his head. And if you look right behind his head at how thick his neck is, keep an eye on that for later and you'll see how much it can stretch out to accommodate this big mouse. So snakes are very interesting also in their reproduction. Uh, some snakes lay eggs, which is the most common way that snakes um, give uh, reproduce. Um, and their eggs aren't like what you see like a chicken egg. They're more of like a leathery kind of material. Um, so some snakes lay eggs and others do what we call it's not really a live birth because they don't have a placenta, um, but they have eggs within their body that hatch inside their body, and then the snakes uh, come out and it, it appears to be like a live birth. Um, they call that ovoviviparous. So ovo meaning egg, and vive meaning alive. So it's an egg live birth. So the saliva in their mouth really starts the digestion process um, and helps it squish the mouse down. You can see how big the mouse was and how big the throat is. So it's been squished a little bit, but it's definitely stretched out his throat quite a bit. Most snakes usually eat rodents and things like that. Some snakes specialize in eating um, eggs or small birds or even other snakes, like the king snake here eats other snakes in the wild. I mentioned earlier that um, snakes don't have eyelids. As you can see, he hasn't blinked this entire time. Um, so sometimes people wonder how they can protect their eyes without any eyelids. Um, they actually have a specialized scale that covers their eyes to keep them protected. And it's very interesting when a snake sheds, they actually shed that extra scale as well. So 
he's almost got it down. And you'll notice right behind his head, his body is doing like an S-shaped motion. And that's another way that helps him uh, swallow that giant mouse, uh, kind of helps pull it down the esophagus. You can see right now how much his neck is stretched out to fit the mouse. And now he's just down to the spaghetti tail. After our snakes eat, we usually let them uh, sit in the feeding tank for a little bit so that they can get the mouse down far enough and kind of settled into their stomach before we pick them up and put them in their home because sometimes uh, they can actually throw up the mouse, which is not fun for either of us. So we will let him settle his lunch in his uh, feeding tank. Just want to say thank you for uh, joining us for our animal feeding. We hope you really enjoyed it and learned some fun facts and hope that you can come visit us soon. Take care and stay safe.